I'm going to talk about creating 3D data files to making uh, patterns for vacuum forming. Uh, essentially, vacuum forming is taking sheet material and heating it up and using suction to form it over a mold. A couple of different mold shapes. Uh, this first one is a, a positive mold where we're taking the material and we're forming it over the top of this part. Another type of tool is a negative uh, tool where the uh, cavity is in our tool and we're uh, using suction to bring the plastic down into that part. Over here on the bottom right, it's a combination of the two where we're going up over the part and then going down into a cavity. So these are all viable solutions, but we're gonna focus on the positive pattern. The negative pattern requires a tool to go down below the trim edge of the plastic. So we don't necessarily need to do that and it's a, it takes a lot more material. So we're gonna use the positive pattern. Combination also works fine. It's the same trim area at the bottom. You can see I have this black line on all of these, which represents the trim line. So if I trim this one at the top, I would end up with the part that I have illustrated at the top. If I trim down at the bottom, I would have a double wall and I would have this negative cavity in there. So that also can work depending on our design. So these are the basic types of configurations. So I'm gonna talk about building uh, the 3D data files for making parts like this for vacuum forming. With vacuum forming, one of the first things we really need to focus in is on draft angle. So I'm gonna build some uh, basic, I have some basic shapes set up here. This part up here with the radiuses, that's the part we're trying to build. Uh, these are patterns, these are the molds. This is not the final production piece because our plastic is gonna go over this part. So we're building just the mold that will make our plastic part. So I extruded these shapes. So I'm just gonna extrude these. I believe I did this at about an inch. Uh, let's just make these all the same color. All right, so these are these parts and they're coming off of my um, working surface here, which is this blue grid. That's a, like a one inch by one inch blue grid. So you can have a feeling for about how big these parts are. So these basic shapes uh, can be, uh, a draft angle can be applied in form Z, we have a draft angle tool and we can control the amount of angle. Uh, I'm gonna use 10 degrees, which is quite large. We could get away with three degrees or five degrees on a vacuum form part, but I'm gonna use 10 just to show the uh, more extreme angle so we can visualize how this is going to work. So with the draft angle, we can just literally click on these parts and it automatically gives us a, this draft angle. That draft angle is what allows the plastic to come off of our pattern. If we didn't have the draft angle or if we had undercuts where the plastic could come underneath, we would never be able to get the plastic off the pattern. So we need to make sure that we do that. If, if the wall was straight up, you probably still could get it off, but it makes it very difficult. So using draft angles allows that to happen uh, more smoothly. I'm just gonna undo the drafts on these two and focus on this one part. So as you can see up here, I have radiuses in the corners and I also have this other step at the bottom, which will be our flange surface. We need to have that because when we're vacuum forming the plastic in the vacuum form tool, the flat surface down here has a, a mesh material which allows the vacuum uh, suction to come through. We don't want that on our part. So we need to create this little step, which will be our flange area. And then we're gonna trim on that. So we're gonna make that flange area a little bit bigger than we need so we have room to work. So I'm just gonna go into wireframe. I'm gonna select the bottom surface uh, of this part. And what I wanna do is I wanna step that out to create this little surface up here. My flange will be about a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna step this out bigger so I have room to work. So I'm gonna step that out at about three eighths of an inch. So I'm gonna use my uh, 2D, 2D wall tool and I'm gonna set that to three eighths. Let's see if it steps out. Okay, so now I've stepped out from my part. I've created this frame that's three eighths of an inch. All I really need is the outside part. So I'm gonna use the uh, line sequence tool and select that. 
and I'm going to extrude that down to the negative below our plane. So I'm going to do a negative. This is kind of arbitrary. I'm going to do about a quarter of an inch, uh, just so it has some substance to this. So if we select that, I now have that piece of material that protrudes down. Uh, I can get rid of the, the 2D wall part. I don't, don't need that. I just need this slab I have at the bottom. I'm going to unghost my actual part. OK, so now I have this flange area, and I have this part on the top. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to radius these corners first. We want these to be pretty generous radiuses so we can um, prevent the material from webbing. So let's see. I'm gonna, this is a little bit arbitrary. Uh, let's round those. I'm going to try to do, let's see, 0.18, 3 sixteenths. Okay, that looks pretty good. So these corners should be as soft as we possibly can. If we can work that into our design and make them very round, that would be easier. If we want to keep it relatively hard edged, uh, we need to try to keep those radiuses somewhat generous. This radius up at the top, we could do a little bit less. So let's do that. Uh, let's try 90 on that. Okay, that's not bad. Since it's only about an inch deep, that should work pretty well. And that's very similar to what I have uh, up here. It's illustrated. These corners down here, I am going to round them. They're a little less important, but it will help keep from uh, the material from webbing. So I'm going to make these pretty generous because it isn't really part of uh, our, our final part. So let's do, let's see, something like that, about three eighths. So it's a little different than this other part I have here, but it's uh, it'll work well. So what I have to do now is just I have these two solids. I have the bottom slab and I have this part. I'll just union those together. And then I would uh, save that out as an STL and use that for 3D printing. Uh, the 3D prints we're going to make here will be uh, durable enough to withstand the heat of the vacuum pour machine. So that would be that part would be ready to go. I know it's a pretty simple part, but that same type of process could be applied to uh, many different shapes. Now, if we don't have a, a vacuum form, uh, I mean, a draft angle tool in the particular software that you're working on, you can build it. I have two sources here. I built the bottom source, and then I built another source smaller. I used lines that I rotated at 10 degrees. So I could just build and fabricate those angles into my part. So I'm just going to loft these. And I have caps on. And then I could just follow the same process to do that. So there's many ways you could build that if you don't have a, a draft angle tool in the particular software that you're working in. Same thing would apply to these other two shapes. You can do multi-cavities. Here I have these three different shapes. I put the draft angle on them already, and I created the bottom slab where I'm going to have my trim edge. So it would be a matter of radiusing these and then putting these together. So you can see I have a pretty good amount of space in between these shapes. Because remember, we're taking that sheet plastic and we're vacuum, we're sucking that in between here. And so we need to have enough room so it doesn't web and get stuck and the material gets in there. That is a little bit of a judgment call. It's hard to predict exactly how it's gonna go. So we have to just sort of guess about how that might work. So we can do multi-cavities like that. There are some shapes that we don't really have to add draft angle to, but they naturally will work like a spherical shape. I took a, a complete sphere and I just cut it in half. And I created my little flange step at the bottom and I didn't apply any draft angle to the sphere. I could apply draft angle to this little uh, area down here for our flange, uh, but this would be ready to go. I could uh, just union this together 
and not actually apply any kind of draft angle. And that would work really, really well. Uh, I did this other geodesic dome here. Uh, that's just with the spherical tool. And I created all these facets. So this is just about ready to go also. There are a few facets down here in a couple of locations on a geodesic dome. Those are straight up. There's no draft angle on those, but those are quite small and they do come down to zero at this one corner. So that would be fine. I think that would actually release pretty well. And then I created the uh, step for the flange area at the bottom. So that would work. Now, all these little angles up at the top here, these surfaces are not uh, at 90 degrees to one another. It's a quite, quite a generous angle in there. So I wouldn't need to radius those. I could leave those and that would actually look quite nice in a vacuum forming, all those facets would be uh, integral into that part. So that would be ready to go without adding any kind of draft angle. Uh, some situations we do have to add draft. Uh, I have this circle here as a guide. Let's uh, ungo this part I made. So if I wanted to stick, let's say like a tennis ball or some kind of a spherical shape, and I wanted to create a vacuum form to do that, I could build in the draft angle in with the part. So I'm just gonna draw a couple of guidelines and just illustrate how that might work. So I'm going to take this line right here and I want to rotate that at my 10 degrees and then integrate that with the curve. So I'm starting on center. I'm selecting this point, which is tangent at this point. So if I rotate this around, it remains tangent to that curve, which is what I want. I want a nice, clean, spherical shape with draft angle at the bottom. So let's say uh, I want to go with the 10 degrees. So I'm just going to come up here I'm going to do 10. So now that is angled out at 10 degrees. So what I can do to make this part is add my curve and use my circle as a guide. I'm going to stay just away from that top area there. I'm going to put a little disc up there instead of uh, bringing that all the way up. It's a good idea to keep that a uh, little bit open so you don't have all those points uh, concentrated at the top. So I'm going to revolve this and make a solid shape out of it. So I'm going to get rid of, no, I'm going to keep that for a second. I'm going to draw my line. I want it to, I'm going to snap to that intersection and then snap to this point. So that line is perfectly the right distance. I'm going to get rid of these two guidelines and ghost my guide circle. So now I have these two pieces and I'm going to join them together and revolve them to make my part. So that's now joined. I'm just going to revolve at 180. I like to do my revolves half at a time and then I stitch them together. So that's half my part. I'm just gonna mirror that around to the front. There's that little open area. So when I stitch this together, I wanna to make it a solid. So there's a couple of tools. I'm just gonna add a circle. We do have a, a close tool. Let's go to wireframe. I could use to close that up. So now when I stitch this all together, that'll be closed. I could make that a little bit smaller. It's a little big, we might see that, but that's the idea. So the bottom is open also. So I put another disc in there to keep that closed. Now it's select all those surfaces and stitch that together. And then I would make this flange area at the bottom, which would be a similar disc that I created here for the sphere. I mean, I could draft angle that out also and create that part. So this would be a, a good pattern to create my vacuum form to contain a spherical shape. As you can see, we can't take the spherical shape and then suck underneath the curve because that would be an undercut and we would never be able to get that spherical shape out. So this is the kind of a vacuum form pattern that we would do to contain a spherical shape. Some other builds. 
This curve shape here on the left, that curve comes off a tool perfectly. There's no draft angle required to build that. I would have to consider draft angle from this side. Let me look at this from the right side. So you can see this part is going straight up. So I created these lines here and I trimmed this back. Now those are at 10 degrees. So let me just ghost the original part. So those angles now will allow this part to come off. Those are like draft angles. So again, I would radius this arc and then build my trim surface at the bottom. And then that would be ready to go as a vac form. Another part, this is an interesting part. So this is a lofted uh, NURBS surface. So it's a, a relatively complex compound curve. Uh, I did this with several sources, but this is just an example of a shape which would look really nice. I don't have any deliberate draft angles and I didn't even create the flange surface. It's integrated into the part. There is a little bit of a flat surface all around here because of the way I lofted this. And then this curve naturally would come right out of the mold. So let's say if I, this contained something, it could contain a spherical shape or a little small components or something like that. So let's just go to the front view. So for me to make this a vacuum form, uh, let's see. I would just mirror this half over. I would make a surface to close off the bottom. And then I would probably raise that up a little bit, uh, like our flange surface that we created on the other one. So I have a trim area. And that could be a really beautiful vacuum form. Now I'm gonna discuss briefly at the end here how these plastic parts are gonna to relate to other packaging components. Uh, so this would probably be like a face seal or a trapped blister uh, with a cardboard, a printed cardboard piece. But that could make a really nice, really nice part. A couple other versions of this, uh, just like I did the spherical shape. If we have a bottle or you have like, you know, a chapstick kind of configuration, which is basically a cylinder and you want it to contain that, you would have to build some sources very similar to how I did the spherical part, but I revolve that. So I would build these sources that I have here and I would take these and I would loft them with caps on and I would create this solid that we have right here. And then what I would have to do is um, slice off the ends and create that draft angle. Let's see if I have that on here for the ends, right side. You can see I have the, um, they're great. Okay, they're right there. I'm just going to select this, view right side, and I would go with my trim split tool, trim split tool uh, with line and stitch. So I would select my part, I have my angle piece here. And if I trim these off like that, so now this part, the cylindrical part has a draft angle built into that source. And I just sliced the ends off so we have draft angles. So that would come off our part. Again, I would radius these two edges and make my stepped area for the flange at the bottom. And then that would be ready to vacuum form. And that could hold a cylindrical shape. So over here, I have a cylinder that I just cut in half. It's the same mentality as the spherical part. Uh, I created the uh, angled parts here so I can slice off the ends and create that draft angle. So that would be a half of a sphere that could be mounted to a cardboard, or I could take two of these and put them back to back and make a trapped blister or a clamshell configuration that would hold a complete cylinder, like a bottle or a chapstick part. So there's just some other configurations of uh, building back forms. One of the categories we're gonna talk about is uh, clamshells. There's my parts, there we go. So clamshell is a hinged vacuum form where you have one hinge down the middle and you're folding it in half. There are many configurations for that. This one I did as a simple two cavity and the, both cavities are identical. But if you go left to right, it's the same process. I'm creating my geometry, adding draft angle, and then adding my radiuses. 
And then over here on the right, I have my a flange surface that I've raised up off the vacuum form machine. The big difference here is I have spacing in between these two parts and I've created this uh, geometric block here. So when the plastic comes over this part and goes over this rectangular section here and then back down again, that would naturally give me a hinge area. There are many ways to make this hinge area. I have done this many times and it seems to work really well, uh, where it creates an area where it can fold the plastic. Again, we're making patterns that we're gonna vacuum form our plastic on. So this is not our actual part. This is just the mold or the pattern to make our plastic part. So all the plastic is on the outside of this. And when you take that off and trim that out, it will naturally fold in that area because I've created that little notch. Now these two parts, parts would come together and fold up. And I have an example of that here at the end about how that works. So here's an example of different types of uh, vacuum forms and the terminology that goes along with them. So over here on the left, your basic type of uh, blister packaging is, here's our blister that we've been working on, I'll show you how to make, and it has that flange. And you just take that and literally stick that to a piece of cardboard that's printed. And that's called a face sealed blister. That is the most traditional and the original versions of blister that's been around for a long time. Another variation of that is a trapped blister, where you have two pieces of cardboard and you die cut the front one and you trap the flange between these two pieces of cardboard. This is a little cleaner looking. It's a little bit more contemporary and it's quite popular right now using a trapped blister because now it's very clean. The clear part is just uh, just in the area of the cavity and not the flange. The flange is trapped. Another one is a mock clamshell. This is where the whole front of the package is plastic. It's the flange that extended all the way out. And then there's a slight thin return to create rigidity. And they take the cardboard and they set that in the back of the blister and they trap that in there and it gets glued to that front face. So now the whole front of the blister, you're looking through the plastic into the printed cardboard, and then the cavity contains the product or the item inside. The next one is an actual clamshell, where you have uh, the front and the back, and there's a hinge down at the bottom, similar to the item I just showed you. And that hinges around, and there's a cavity usually in the front and the back, and that quite often will trap a piece of cardboard on the inside. This can have a locking edge, it can be heat staked, there can be a snap edge. There's a lots of different ways that uh, clamshells can be held together. Uh, but this is a pretty basic configuration. So these are the simple versions of, uh, clam, of uh, vacuum forms. There are other more complex versions that I'm gonna show in another tutorial that include uh, trifolds and things like that.